I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed unto us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We live in an anxious world. Surely there is no disputing that fact. For more than a year now, of course, we have been living in the midst of a global pandemic, which has meant navigating the past year by avoiding the charybdis of contagion only by sailing into the scylla of lockdowns that have isolated us from our families and friends and threatened to overwhelm our mental resources. And as if this hadn't been enough, in the midst of all that uncertainty, we've been pummeled by stories of profound injustice and inequity, by political and social unrest, and by fears on all sides that either nothing will change or that the institutions that supposedly guarantee our rights and freedoms, or at least those who hold authority at the moment within them, will be unequal to the tasks that the present has set before them and will come apart at the seams or be pulled apart, leaving us in a chaos in which human life will be nasty, brutish, and short. Now, of course, we do live in an anxiety-inducing world, and if we were not affected by it in any way, it would only go to show that we had become insensitive and insensible, that our emotions were no longer reacting appropriately to the world around them. It would mean, for example, that we should have become incapable of empathy, for we, we would be unmoved by the suffering of our neighbors. It would mean that we could not rejoice in the blessings we have received at the hands of God or at the good fortune of our fellows. We could not, as St. Paul bid us on the second Sunday after the Epiphany, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Now it's tempting to think that the way out of this state of anxiety is to try to change the world that seems to make us anxious, to change the world that, as we say, triggers our anxiety. But of course, even if we were able to create a utopia in which technology had eliminated disease and our political institutions had eradicated injustice and inequity, the latter eventuality which is devoutly to be wished, it would not, because it could not, change the fundamentally transitory nature of life. The fear of death and the loss of occasions would remain and civilization, however advanced, would always stand at the whim of despotism, natural disaster, or any of the myriad other historical contingencies that could bring about its demise. There is, that is to say, no salvation through manipulation of the world out there. And no amount of activism, however necessary it may be at one moment or the other, can truly make us whole. Yet we should know this already, shouldn't we? If we've been paying attention to the Church's proclamation since Advent, we'll remember that when St. Paul bid us rejoice always and be anxious in nothing, it was not because Roman law had united the world in common cause, or even because all people were about to become subject to the law of Moses, but rather because the Lord was at hand. He was saying that the true light which lighteth every man was coming into the world. You see, it is seeing that light, and indeed seeing all things ourselves and the rest of creation by that light, that is the cause of any true joy. Moreover, we remember what our Lord himself told us on the third Sunday after Easter. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. 
the world, our Lord's shorthand for those who have loved darkness rather than light, rejoices in the darkening of the light. But those who await the coming again of the light with patience will be joyful at his appearing. Yet they will not be made joyful because the light replaces their sorrow, but rather because their sorrow will have been turned into joy. The suffering of this present life, he told us then, is like the pains of childbirth. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered, she remembereth no more the anguish for the joy that the child is brought into the world. And now ye therefore have sorrow, that I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. St. Paul is simply echoing these words of our Lord in this morning's epistle, when he tells us that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The whole created order, not only human beings, but animal, vegetable, and mineral creation, not only as we are in our joys, but also in our sorrows, scream and labor to bring into existence a joy which shall not, because it cannot, be taken from us. The created order is subject to vanity, that is to say, subject to the vicissitudes of time and change, in which nothing is wholly itself at any moment, because that is how God made it. But it is not ultimately a vain existence, either for the human creature or any other creature, because it is subject in hope of the glory that is to be revealed in and through it when it is seen in the light of God's own knowledge of it. In our colic this morning, we have prayed that we may so pass through things temporal that we finally lose not the things eternal. Now, it's important to look at this carefully. Notice that we are most emphatically not praying that we should pass out of things temporal so that we might enjoy some other eternal things, but that we might pass through, go through temporal things in such a way as not to lose eternal things. In other words, our not losing temporal thing, eternal things depends somehow on how we pass through temporal things. Our not losing eternal things somehow depends on how we pass through temporal things. But why should this surprise us? After all, we've learned, haven't we, because our Lord has taught us through his church's proclamation that it is precisely the sorrows of this world that will be turned into joy. We are not passing through this world only to escape what we have done or what has been done to us. In the light of God's knowledge, which we have been given and in which we long to share fully, we will see all of that joy and sorrow, as they go to make up the glory that is being revealed in us, and in which eternally we shall rejoice. Well, that's all a lovely thought, but how does that hope, that earnest expectation of what we know by faith will be hereafter, not remain simply an abstract hope, a hope that cannot in any way help us to understand how the present is being taken up into the eternal. How, in other words, can it lead to any difference in my life here and now? Well, that has to do with the change in our perspective. And that change in perspective involves, as our gospel teaches us this morning, the acquisition of the virtue of mercy. That virtue whereby our neighbor's pain, sorrow, suffering, want becomes our pain, sorrow, suffering, and want, and therefore affects us as if it were our own. Now, mercy is not mere empathy. It's not simply that when others suffer, we feel their pain, although it might perhaps involve this. It's rather 
the recognition that our neighbor's loss is our law. Because our neighbor's good is our good. In other words, it arises from our knowledge and our recognition in knowledge that God shares himself equally with us and with our neighbors because his infinite generosity, his infinite love, is nothing other than who he is. His infinite generosity, his infinite love, is nothing other than who he is. So if we truly love God for who he is, that is to say if we love God and not some idol we've created in his place, if we love infinite love and infinite generosity, we cannot not love our neighbor. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? So charity, divine love, the acquisition of which is the whole purpose of the Christian life and the whole purpose of this holy season, will be shown forth as mercy. As God has loved us and shows his life for us, and gives his life for us in showing us mercy. So we show our love for God by showing mercy to our fellows. Not as part of the transaction whereby we are promised salvation if we do good to others, but because we love God and loving him cannot not love our neighbor. When our perspective has evolved to that point, then the glory of God will have been revealed perfectly in us. Then even our own sufferings will be seen as revealing God's glory and will be a cause for rejoicing. And if we cannot yet love our neighbor because we can love our own life by living it in and for them, Well, then, if we're not at that point, we do not yet love God and our neighbor as we ought, for we do not yet see clearly by God's own light. So we must return our gaze unto that light as it shines in and through our own nature. We must gaze upon the light itself as it has come into the world, born, living, teaching, suffering, dying, rising, and ascending, and as it comes into the world now, under the appearance of bread and wine. And as we gaze, so our darkness will be lightened, and we will know him more and more fully as he is. And as we know him, we cannot but love him. And in his love we shall become merciful, even as he himself is merciful to whom with his Father and their co-eternal spirit we ascribe almight, majesty, dominion, and glory, henceforth and forevermore. Amen.